Welcome back. Uh, we, we, now, we now come to uh, our closing speaker. As we have uh, mentioned before, there is a president of AMSIS on a cyclical basis. Uh, the Air Force Surgeon General was the president that this year and, and next year it will be the VA. Uh, I know that all of you know that we will be back here about the same time uh, for the 2017 meeting uh, led by the uh, Veterans Administration. Therefore, it's a particular pleasure for us uh, that our closing speaker in preparation for next year is Mr. Sloan Gibson, who is the DEPSEC, DEF, DEPSEC Veterans Affairs. DEPSEC DEF rolls off my lips too easily, who was uh, Senate confirmed on February 11th, 2014. Mr. Gibson is an Army Infantry Officer uh, with an Airborne Wing and Ranger TAB qualifications. He has a master in economics from University of Missouri uh, and a master of public administration from Harvard. Uh, prior to coming to the VA, he was president and CEO of the USO. Before that, he spent uh, 20 years in the banking industry, retiring as vice chair and chief financial officer of AmSouth Bank Corporation. Uh, he has a long history of leadership with nonprofit organizations, most notably the United Way. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce Mr. Sloan Gibson as our, as our closing speaker. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to start by making everybody uncomfortable. We got a small group here. And I can stand and, and do a, a presentation to, uh, to uh, thousands, or you guys can come forward, and we can make this a whole lot more casual. So I'm gonna ask you guys, if you will, come on up here, occupy the first few rows of tables, and, and we'll make this a little bit more interactive, okay? I'll leave time at the tail end for, for questions and that sort of thing, but, but I think with a group this small, as, as I'm rattling along, along here, somebody holler at me and wave if you see something that you want, that you've got a question about, and we'll take a couple of minutes to, to try to address it. Now let's see, have I got a, looks like I've got a clicker here. And it only appears to go in one direction, so I better not mess up. So if I have to go back, I'm gonna be in, in, in trouble. Uh, first of all, uh, it was great to see Greg Gadsden and Roy Cooper. Uh, I would tell you, uh, during my time at the USO, we, we, one of the sort of the strategic shifts we made was expanding an awful lot more support into the wounded warrior space and, and into the families of wounded warriors. And so for me, and I learned a lot about that space from those two guys, as well as from a lot of other folks, uh, it's great to see them, and it's great to see this body focusing attention on that particular, uh, that particular demographic. Very understandable, but I could really relate to an awful lot of what I was hearing and the points that were being made. Secondly, thank you very much for recognizing Dr. Bally Yehea last night. Uh, I, I think Bally is uh, a genius. He is a brilliant guy. Uh, but not only is he a brilliant guy, he knows how to get stuff done. And that's a, that's a combination that is um, uh, a bit rare. And uh, so thank you all for recognizing Bally. And I would tell you some of the things that I'm going to talk about here in terms of our direction for community care in the future are really concepts and ideas that are a product of Bally's work. He is a remarkable young clinician. And I got to tell you, as long as VA can attract and retain brilliant young physicians like Bally, uh, we're going to be great. We're going to be good to go. Here are some themes. I want to start with a story. Uh, I had been at VA for about 90 days, about three months, when I found myself as the new acting secretary. And so, as you might imagine, I was... Uh, trying to climb the learning curve as fast as I could. I had started engaging with people like Ken Kaiser and John uh, Perlin months and months before as I was preparing for confirmation. Uh, but uh, Harvey Feinberg came to see me uh, just a, a couple of days after he stepped down after 12 years at the Institute of Medicine. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the famous quote, Winston Churchill says, never let a good uh, crisis go to waste. And I was, I was proceeding to tell Harvey 
uh, you know, I think we can get some things done over the next two or three years that otherwise would have taken VA two or three decades. And Harvey immediately disagreed. He said, no, VA can do things now it never could have done. I think Harvey was right. It was us to, up, to, up to us to seize that opportunity. And that's what we've really been about these last two or two and a half years. These are some themes, and I'm going to touch on uh, most of them as over the course of the conversation. I'm going to talk quite a bit about in integrated enterprise and scope and scale in just a moment. So I'm going to come back to those. Uh, one of the big challenges we have to this third point about reducing variability. Uh, at VA, we know how to deliver great care, and we know how to deliver a great care experience. The challenge we have is we, we don't have the rigor in our systems and processes that helps us ensure that we're delivering that great care and great care experience every single time. We're too reliant on the, the commitment and the passion of the frontline clinicians and support staff in ensuring that we do that. Um, I, I note here that, that I, the idea of building trust in brand, let me tell you what I'm talking about. We complete round numbers about 7 million appointments, outpatient appointments a month at VA. About 5 million are completed inside VA, about 2 million are completed in the community. Care that we coordinate, that we're responsible for, that we pay for. If we get it right, if we deliver great care and a great care experience, 99.5% of the time, that means that 35,000 times every month, we don't get it right. Now, for an organization that is not only the largest healthcare organization in America, but the most transparent, that presents challenge, challenges for us as we're working to build trust. Because it doesn't take but one of those anecdotal stories where we didn't deliver that great care experience to undermine the trust that veterans and taxpayers and elected representatives have in the organization. So this is an ongoing challenge for our organization We'll never be perfect. Nobody's perfect in healthcare. Uh, but we've got to continue to drive that continuous improvement, which I note down here toward the very tail end, to continue to work toward that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're doing some of that in a, in a, in a few minutes. Exploiting expansive information and preparing for change. We're going to show some examples of some of the information I'm reminded uh, in the past, uh, before uh, the, the current leadership team at VA, we used to have a meeting every morning called Stand Up. I had heard about it. I was relieved when I got to VA and, and learned that I didn't have to stand up during the meeting. I actually got to sit down. So I was relieved about that. But we would talk about all kinds of things. A, a, a series of people would come into the secretary's office and brief us on uh, you know, uh, security and preparedness and severe weather anticipated and IT systems and if a system went down in the previous night somewhere. Uh, uh, what happened in legislative affairs in the last 24 hours? What, what were their significant media items that, that we needed to, to talk about? Well, my first day as the acting secretary, stand up became access to care stand up. And we did that every single day for many months. We still do access to care stand up, but David Shulkin and I do it only maybe once or twice a week. And to be clear, this isn't just VHA leadership in the room. This is leadership from across the enterprise. Uh, folks from IT, folks from HRNA, folks from contracting and other areas the, the, the idea here is to get the right kind of leadership in the room, very short lines of communication, so that we make decisions on the spot and we move out to execute. Back to my information, expansive information. So I can remember the first time we did that. We did it in my office. Uh, and there were two or three of us crowded around a laptop computer looking at an Excel spreadsheet. Let me give you an idea of what we got now. First of all, we meet in our integrated operations center surrounded by screens and, and information. We've developed, among other, a whole suite of management information tools, something that we call the Healthcare Operations Dashboard. Uh, some months back when the team came to demo that for me in the office, I had been spending time earlier in the day on a mental health issue. 
And so as they booted it up on a laptop, I says, okay, I want to I wanna look at mental health. Uh, I don't want to look at pending appointments. I want to look at consults. But not all consults. I only want to look at stat level one consults. Stat, stat consults, excuse me, stat consults and mental health. And I want to look at those that are pending over 90 days. Now, as you all would expect, there should be zero. There weren't zero. There were 56. What you could then do is click on that and all of a sudden you'd see all the information by vision, by network. Click on a particular vision, you'd see it all by medical center. Click on a particular medical center, you see it by clinic. Click on a particular clinic, you see it by, um, by patient. And you're, so you're able to take that kind of information and drill it all the way down to the individual clinic level to understand where we may have a gap in care. Now start thinking about that back up uh, to the prior bullet and think about what the opportunity that presents for introducing additional rigor. Uh, I'm gonna come to a point here in a few minutes talking about what's happened with consults. So keep that in the back of your mind. The other part of that bullet talks about preparing for change. Uh, priority group 1A, veterans. Uh, this is a priority group that, among other things, is entitled to long-term care at VA expense. Priority group 1A veterans are predicted, forecasted, to double in the next 10 years. Does anybody here think we got enough capacity in our community living centers, our CLCs, to handle that surge? Does anybody here think that state nursing homes have that capacity? So what we're doing now is working with NASDAVA, the National Association of State Directors of Veterans Affairs, who are our primary partners in providing long-term care to the veteran population, and beginning to look at that challenge that we have in front of us. That leads to the very next point, aligning resources with requirements. We've got to start communicating. In fact, I had this uh, conversation last night in Boston with the state uh, uh, Secretary of Veterans Affairs. We've got to start having this conversation with the administration and with Congress now. So when they come, when NASDAQ comes to town in February, they're going to be armed with information as they go out and, and talk to their respective delegations to talk about this emerging problem and the fact that we've got to get ready now because that's coming. And we've got to find new modalities and new ways of dealing with this. Some of you may or may not be aware with, of, of home-based primary care and how VA does that. Sixty-some-odd thousand veterans last year were, were uh, benefits of home-based primary care. Less expensive than institutional care. Veterans like it better because they're able to stay home. Um, it, it's, it's, but, it, but it's that kind of a model that we've got to explore and be prepared to invest in in order to be able to do this. That's looking around the corner and anticipating change. It's also aligning resources with requirements. Standardizing training and, uh, and establishing some routine procedures. We have 25,000 medical support assistants, MSAs. Uh, they are the people that do the scheduling as well as a number of other administrative type support activities and customer service activities in our clinics. Uh, I'm gonna draw a point of comparison. Uh, when I would go travel, as I spent a lot of time, as Bob McDonald does, out in our medical centers, I would uh, canvas and survey and say, tell me, tell me what you do here for a new uh, MSA that you hire off the street. What's the onboarding process? What's the training process? Soup to nuts. But more often than not, what I would hear typically was five or six or seven hours of online training through the standard TMS online training modules, and then it's all OJT out on the front line after that. Now let me give you a point of comparison. When VBA, the Benefits Administration, hires a new VSR, Veteran Service Representative, this is the entry level position to begin to develop a claim for a decision. When they hire a new VSR off the street, they start with four weeks of distance learning. These are mostly instructor-led classes conducted over the web. And then they travel to either Denver or Baltimore for four weeks of classroom face-to-face -face training. 
before they ever go out and start working to do their job. And they're mentored and coached and everything else as you would expect once they get to the facility. You see the difference. We spend, my estimate is round numbers, we spend about $750 million a year just in base salary for our MSA workforce. Imagine if we actually trained them. Imagine. Standard training. So we are now, we've just gotten past the union hurdle as it happens, so that we can now start training our MSAs, standard two-week face-to-face curriculum, every single new MSA coming in the door, gets trained to do scheduling exactly the same way in every clinic all across America. Continuous improvement I touched on, and I'm going to follow up with some comments there uh, as well. Quick comment on rules-based uh, culture, uh, rules-based versus principles-based. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, this was probably a year and a half ago. Veteran drives, veteran breaks his foot. He drives four hours through the night to get to his VA medical center uh, because that's where he wants to receive his care. Uh, he arrives there in the wee hours of the morning. He parks as close as he can to the emergency room door, but he needs help to get from his car to the emergency room. He calls the medical center and the instruction that he gets is call 911. Um, the person that told him that thought she was doing the right thing. And I understand all the issues about dispatching your code blue team to some distant part of the parking lot. That's not what we were talking about here. A veteran needed help to get from his car to the emergency room after driving for four hours. The fire department showed up and with the wheelchair and brought the veteran in. Um, the point that I've made with employee audiences from me, the principle here, and, and it's a simple question, what would you want somebody to do if it was your mother? Go help. And if you don't have the ability or the skill or the know-how to offer the help that's required, get more help. That's simple. That's the kind of principle-based transition that we're working to make and at the same time trying to make it safe for people to be able to do that. So I promised that I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, integrated enterprise. So let me, let me talk about this for a second. Why, I can't go back now, so I just screwed up already. Why is it important to operate like an integrated enterprise? Because you can't leverage your scope and scale if you don't. Why is scope and scale important? I would argue that it's the greatest strategic advantage that VA has as a healthcare organization, is our scope and our scale. It is the greatest strategic advantage. I'm going to give you an example in a second. But if you stop and you think about what does it take to operate like a, a, an integrated enterprise, you don't just snap your finger and take an organization whose history and legacy was that every VA medical center was different and all of a sudden throw the switch and say, all of a sudden we're all gonna operate like an integrated enterprise. It doesn't work like that. There's some enabling infrastructure that you have to have. And here's some of what I've lined out here. I'm gonna give you a great example of management information. We talked standard processes just a, a second ago and some consistent training. As we've learned, as I've learned very painfully, internal communication, if you don't have the ability to communicate up and down the organization, you're not going to be able to operate like an integrated enterprise. Change management, change management. If every medical center is going to do their own thing, you don't really need an enterprise-wide change management function. But if on the other hand, you need to roll out something like choice in a short period of time, you're talking about very substantial change. And we tried to do that without any change management capability inherent in the organization. Common IT systems, every, every, I think everybody here probably knows, VA is known for their electronic health record. What you may not know is that we have 131 different instances of VISTA. It's not all one version of VISTA because VISTA got developed on a decentralized kind of model. And so we get ready to go do something like, I don't have my smartphone, my iPhone with me, early next year, if the union will allow us, we're going to give veterans the ability to schedule an appointment on their smartphone. But you know what the, one of the biggest hurdles is? Different scheduling practices and different VISTA systems all across the country. 
We've got a standardized scheduling practice, and we've got to install this software each instance of Vista in order to be able to roll out that kind of, that kind of functionality. And then I'm going to talk later about spread of best practices. So let me give you an example here about, about leveraging scope and scale. Think about just the mental health space for a second. We complete 550,000 mental health outpatient appointments every single month. We integrate mental health into primary care like almost no other large private sector healthcare organization. We have inpatient programs. I, I'm not going to remember the number. We have something like 140 different residential treatment programs all across the country. We got 300 vet centers, well kept secret, where combat veterans and their families can go for counseling and support. We have a veterans crisis line. We don't want to talk about that later. I'd be glad to. We have completely revamped the veterans crisis line in the last 12 months. More than doubling staff, uh, adding a second location so that we've got geographic redundancy and also an incredibly wonderful pool to, uh, to recruit from. We've got, we've got non-clinical determinants of health. Disability compensation. Uh, compensation, let's see, I think some of these are on the next slide. Disability compensation, homelessness services. We provide stipends to caregivers, uh, education support, vocational rehabilitation, all those are non-clinical determinants of health. Clinicians tell me that the fact that we have our own organic pharmacy is, is an important part uh, in delivering health care. And then the fact that we've got this electronic health uh, record, and I'm going to give you an example of why that's such a powerful lever for scope and scale. So let me ask you a question. What healthcare organization in the world has this kind of capacity to be able to surround and care for their mental health patients? Anybody. I don't know of one either. So here's the power. We already do a pretty good job of this, but not nearly as good as it can be. Let me give you an example. ReachVet is mentioned down there. What we've done is we've taken the robust data that we've got in the electronic health uh, record. We've, we've built algorithms, experts have helped us build algorithms, and we've gone in and we've identified the one-tenth of one percent of veterans that are at greatest risk for attempting a suicide in the next 12 months. Think about that. Think about that, what that means for treatment at a medical center. Think about our veterans crisis line for a second. Imagine, I've been imagining this, we're not there yet, but I've been imagining this. The phone rings and a red flag goes up on the responder screen. This is one of those one-tenth of one percent veterans. These are people that are 81 times more likely to attempt suicide in the next 12 months than the norm. Think about that. And then think about, think about this, the flag going up on the responders phone or, or the manager's phone so the supervisor's on the phone as well because we want to make sure we get it right then think about the handoff to the suicide prevention coordinator which we do more than 80,000 times a year think about that handoff and saying this is one of our veterans that we need to make sure doesn't fall through the cracks think about the ability to leverage our scope and scale to care for those veterans that's that's why we need to operate have to operate like an integrated enterprise uh, in in uh, a little over a year ago, we, we laid out a set of breakthrough initiatives. My VA transformation, we call it my VA because we want to put the veterans at the heart of everything we're doing. We've got transition team in, as you might expect right now. And I've already heard a little bit of feedback indirectly from one, from one member of the transition team. After he got briefed on my VA, he said, I thought that was a bumper sticker. I thought that was just a slogan. There's real substance. You guys are doing stuff. Yeah, we're doing stuff. And these are the 12 breakthrough initiatives that we established for 2016. Every single one of these has specific quantified outcomes that we're driving toward that directly impact the veteran and our ability to serve and care for the veteran. Every single one of them. These 12, six of, six of them are mine as an executive sponsor. Six of them are Bob McDonald's. Every two weeks, a cross-functional senior leadership team sits down in my office or in his office and briefs us on our progress. And we identify obstacles and things that are getting in the way. 
issues where we need to accelerate or reallocate resources so that we can actually deliver, actually deliver the outcomes that we're looking for. So let me talk about in the healthcare space, let me talk about a couple of those. So you roll the calendar back two and a half years and you look at improving access to care. That's where all the, the crisis started. And as I thought about it, it struck me there are four levers that we've got to pull on. Staffing, space, productivity, and care in the community. And you see here what we've been doing uh, on all four of those fronts here over the last couple of years. Specifically in care in the community. Uh, you can see the trend over the last couple of years from about 16 million appointments in the community to over 25 million appointments in the community. Care in the community and that includes our federal partners, our federal health care partners, is a fact of life. It's a vital component today. It's going to be a vital component tomorrow in the, in the delivery of care for veterans. What we want to do is make it more seamless for the veteran. Not thinking about it in terms of inside or outside, but it's here's what the veteran needs. Here's the location that the veteran is in. How do we best deliver that care for that veteran? And how do we make sure that we're integrating care? You know, that's a strategic shift for us. We're historically a provider of care. And as you all know, and understand even far better than I do, uh, managing health care outcomes and managing population health, entirely different sort of mission set uh, and set of skills and competencies that you need to be able to do that. Lots of talk about choice. Well. Of all the care in the community, choice is less than a quarter. If you take this back to the other slide, what you see of, of the total care delivered, choice is about 7%. It's important. And we keep working at it, as you can see here. Uh, I've told uh, audiences publicly, I said this in, in, in a congressional testimony, uh, the biggest mistake I made in the last two years and nine months that I've been at VA is I didn't push back on Congress when they said roll choice out in 90 days. And I still live with that mistake. That's my mistake. That's on me. And you can see some of the things that we've had to do. Four changes in the legislation, 40 contract modifications. You can't say boo without modifying the contract. Now a network of almost 450,000 providers. How long did it take TRICARE to stand up? How long did it take try years for TRICARE to stand up and build a network and become the high performing uh, uh, operation that it is today? And we work to try to stand this up in, in, uh, in 90 days. Um, I, I alluded briefly, and, and I, I, I left this in here for, for particular emphasis. Um, absolutely critical to VA is, is the, the DOD network of MTS uh, and our other healthcare partners. Uh, everywhere I go, one of the things that's really delighted me as I travel around to, to uh, VA medical centers is I hear about the, working, the local working relationships and alliances that have been established with their nearby MTS. Uh, and my sense is, and you all again, you understand this better than I do, um, that has to continue. It's right for DOD, it's right for VA, it's right for veterans, it's right for service members and their families, it's right for the taxpayer. Every way you look at this, the need for DOD and other, and other federal health care partners to work collaboratively, for us to work collaboratively together, is the right thing to do unequivocally. That's the case today and it's going to be the case tomorrow. And we got to keep working at trying to figure out how we break down some of the remaining barriers. I co-chair the JEC, the Joint Executive Committee, that sort of oversees all of the collaboration between VA and DOD. I co-chair it with the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. And that's where we bring a lot of these issues to a head. You know, the, the pilot that we've got going on in Chicago. You know, he, we, we both agree absolutely positively we have to keep making that work but but for example one of the things we did is we stood up the the uh, the joint facility there but then we told them but you can't fire anybody you can't move anybody out well that's crazy that's nonsense you gotta you gotta give the people on the ground the leadership on the ground both DOD and VA the authority 
to build a high-performing organization. And you don't do that by putting people in straitjackets. So this is absolutely critical to us. Now roll the calendar forward a little bit. You're getting into the My VA breakthrough initiatives. Some of the things that we're doing in the healthcare space. Same day access to primary care and mental health services. Let me explain what that means. It's not open access, not the same thing. Uh, it may be uh, if a veteran needs care right away, it may be that we're able to deliver that care by a face-to-face -face appointment. We do 22% of our completed appointments, more than a million a month are same day appointments. So we're delivering a lot of same day care, but that's not necessarily the only solution. Could be a phone call or a secure message with a, with a clinician. We do more than a million secure message strings between a patient and a clinician every single month. I wish I could communicate with my primary care physician by email. I can't, I can't do that. It could be a telephone consult. It could be, it could be a, a, a telephone consult with a nurse to triage the situation. It could be filling a prescription. It could be coming in and meeting with a nurse. But the idea is where the veteran needs care right away, we're gonna figure out a way to give them care right away. We got to be able to do that. Um, Stat level one consults, I mentioned this earlier. Um, part of what we've been able to do under David Shulkin's leadership is, is to bring intense focus both on consults and pending appointments for care needed right away. And so what we've done using some of those management information tools that I was talking about before and building into the day-to-day the -day management process at a medical center, this rigor of reviewing stat consults in what we call level one clinics. Those are clinics like oncology and cardiology and, and neurology and, and, and clinics like that. Building that into their daily management rhythm, reviewing every single stat consult they got put, that gets put on the books. Part of that meant getting physicians to quit making everything stat. That was step one, because we didn't have good data. And so getting all that calibrated and then building the rigor into the systems and process, we wind up, it's not managing to the average, it's looking at the entire distribution of care quality and care experience and tackling the tail. So you, drive, you shrink the tail and you drive the median toward the great uh, care experience into the spectrum. We've seen, I, I'm not gonna remember the numbers off the top of my head, but the stat level one consults pending over two days, not over 90 days, over two days, has gone from thousands down to a couple hundred, something like that, across an organization our size. Improved enrollment for healthcare. We, we enroll about 400,000 veterans for healthcare every single year. It's a big deal. What we had in the place was a very fragmented, inefficient, ineffective system that sometimes took veterans more than 100 days to get enrolled for care. Most of that enrollment was happening out in the facility. Uh, if you did go online, there was a, a form called the 1010 Easy. Some of you may be familiar with that, may have heard of it before, the 1010 Easy. You could go online. Now, the first thing you had to know is you had to have the most recent version of Adobe Acrobat or it wouldn't let you open the 10, 10 easy. So for starters, and think about our patient population, okay, for a second, think about our patient population. Now think the most recent version of, the, of Adobe Acrobat. But if you could get to the 10, 10 easy online, get in there, fill it out, then what? Print it, print it and sign it because the regulation required a wet signature. Then mail it in and welcome to the land of Oz and we'll see what happens to that application. We took our digital services team. These are folks that came to us from Google and Facebook and organizations like that using human-centered design techniques, speaking directly with veterans who are in the enrollment process, and we completely redesigned the experience. We established a single website. We have, we have hundreds of websites and, um, uh, and landing pages. Vets, veterans now can go to vets.gov, and that's the one place that they can go. We still got a lot of the websites out there, but we're rolling the functionality in. We put the new healthcare application on vets.gov. You go in there, it takes about 25 minutes. Complete your healthcare application. Our goal is to be able to provide a decision within an hour. We're not quite there yet. 
We're not quite there yet, but that's where we're headed. If you don't want to do it online, fine. You go to vets.gov, you'll find a telephone number, call that phone number, and they will take your application over the phone. And they'll use the same form to fill it out as they go so that the system can do all the work. Pull the DD-214 and all the other information that's needed. What happens after the veteran enrolls for health care? Two business days later, they receive a phone call. Welcome to my VA. Would you like to schedule an appointment? Let's find the medical facility that's closest to you that, has, that can provide the care that you need. Oh, while we're on the phone, let's talk about the other services and benefits that you may be eligible for. We did that for all of our newly enrolled veterans during fiscal year 2016. So we did roughly 400,000 of those. We asked veterans to rate the experience on a scale of one to five. They rated a 4.9, pretty good. How on VA like is that, okay? My VA, putting the veteran at the center of everything we do. Seamless care across the enterprise. Veterans told us that it was hard to get care, get a prescription refilled, see a provider when they were traveling and they were away from their regular facility. But we came to understand that there were some of our own internal rules about resource allocation that were getting in the way. We changed them. And then the other thing that we've done, and we'll roll it out probably in January, I tried to get it for December, probably in January, a new, a new uh, application for our pharmacist called 1VA Pharmacy. Because we've got 131 different instances of Vista, you can't go in and actually decrement a prescription that was issued at another VA facility. So we've built the software so, so pharmacists can be able to do that, no matter where the veteran's from streamlining that process, making that care available. Uh, I mentioned earlier about sharing best practices. Uh, you know, one of the great advantages of scale, we've got, I'm, I'm astounded every time I go traveling someplace to see what folks on the ground have figured out how to do. Best practices of all shapes and varieties, and nobody knows about it. So what we've done is built processes and structure to identify and vet those best, those best practices, we actually run shark tanks. We run shark tanks where, where some of our senior leaders bid on those particular best practices to implement at their, at their particular facilities and diffuse those. We've got hundreds of those that are now being implemented across the enterprise. That was part of the, of, of the same day access to primary care. Did we come up with something at the top of VA and say, this is how you're going to do it? No. We went out to the field and found 24 best practices already in place. And then we take, along with a, a team of systems engineers and clinicians working together, and go facility by facility, identify the best practices that are most relevant to that particular facility, and that's what we implement. And I got to tell you, building and exercising that change management muscle is one of the things that I'm most excited about. Not only are we going to provide same-day access to primary care services, but we're actually learning how to do change management effectively, which has been a profound weakness. Freeing capacity. We do something uh, as part of our leader developing leader sessions. We now bring in all of our senior leaders a couple of times a year. We've never done that in the past, but we've taken them through multi-day programs called Leaders Developing Leaders. One of the things we do in that session is called RAMP. It's everybody's favorite thing to do. And we cascade these sessions all the way down in the organization. Ramp, um, reports, approvals, meetings, metrics, and policies. Ramp. And we, and we turn the group loose. Whatever level it is, turn them loose, identify things that we can get rid of. Everybody loves it. And so we started looking at some things. One of the things we found was that at facilities, because of the way we allocate resources, Veterans had to be seen at least within a two-year period of time. They had to be registered. They had to be vested at a particular facility or the facility didn't get credit for the veteran. So we actually set up vesting clinics where the purpose of the vesting clinic was so that, to see the veteran so that we could punch the button and say, okay, you're good to go for another two years. You can get your prescriptions refilled. Or, you know, if a veteran goes to an emergency room for, for bona fide emergency care, and they haven't been to VA within the last two years, we won't pay for it. You know, that's why it's so important to fix these things. 
It's important internally, it's important externally. So we freed up capacity for primary care. It used to be that if you wanted to go to an audiologist or an optometrist, you had to get referred through primary care. No more. That also had to do with the vesting issue because primary care was the vesting uh, clinic. We've also learned that we've got some advantages at VA in terms of being able to leverage our pharmacist uh, to, to be uh, much more actively involved in, uh, in the management of, of ongoing medication for chronic disease. And so at, one of our, at our facility that was the best practices up in Madison, Wisconsin, they freed up 20% of primary care capacity by leveraging their PharmDs. So looking for ways to improve access. I want to talk very briefly, and I want to leave some time for some questions too, because I'm sorry I'm running on here. I'll, I'll speed it up. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with SAIL. Uh, we had, I'm not going to mention the name of the organization, uh, the chief medical officer of the, one, of, one of the largest healthcare organizations in America spent some time with us now, it's probably a couple of years ago. He looked at what we were doing in sale. He said, if I had this in my organization, I'd implement it tomorrow. It's that good. You see here sort of the parameters in sale. This is our roadmap for improving veteran healthcare outcomes. We measure every medical facility in the organization against these metrics. And there are a bunch of these that you're going to recognize, Oryx and Hedis and others. You're going to recognize these metrics. One of the things that we did back in uh, actually the beginning of 2015, fiscal 15, uh, I, I came to understand that there was no correlation between the performance evaluation of our medical center directors and the veteran health care outcomes as measured under sale. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me. So we incorporated at the beginning of 15, fiscal year 15, we incorporated sale results into the performance evaluation of every single medical center director. In the next 12 months, 60% of our medical centers had an absolute improvement in healthcare outcomes as measured under sale. And as you can see here, I don't know if it got chopped off up there. This is for, this is for 16, it's 82%. Between the end of 15 and the end of 16, 82% of VA medical centers had an absolute meaningful improvement in healthcare outcomes for their veterans. This isn't a stick that we beat people up with, it is a roadmap for finding ways to deliver better healthcare outcomes. Part of what we do, if, the, if we've got a facility that's struggling, we'll dispatch a team. I've got a team right now that's spending 12 to 15 weeks on the ground in Phoenix working hand in hand, side by side with clinicians to improve veteran healthcare outcomes. So, and, we, and we've done some other things, particularly in the mental health space that I don't have time to talk about that I'd love to tell you about. Sale, absolutely vital, and this is getting back to operating like an integrated enterprise. Pretty cool. So part of this is healthcare outcomes. That's one of the, that's one of the outcomes that we're looking for. Another outcome, patient satisfaction. This is what we see right now in the CAP survey. So this is industry standard kind of stuff. Industry standard kind of stuff. You know, our patients tell us that, that we do better than the private sector in terms of the quality of care, their perception of the quality of care, but we don't do as well as the private sector in terms of, of, of access to care. We've got more work to do. One of the things we did not long ago, about nine months ago, is we started asking veterans one question when they checked in at the kiosk in the outpatient clinic, how satisfied were you with the appointment, with the timeliness of the appointment that you got for today? 89% tell us they are either satisfied or completely satisfied. We're getting better. And under the CAPS metric, you go back two years, steady improvement. Not where we need to be yet, more work to do. 17, we haven't stopped. Nobody's taken a knee at VA. Nobody's taken a knee. We're running all the way through the tape. We've already laid the pipe for 2017 with an array of 2017 breakthrough initiatives. They fall into these 13 different categories. Here are some that relate to work, particularly in the healthcare space, taking the access measures to the next level now. One of the things I mentioned earlier about, uh, about improving the, the veterans crisis line, we have now built what I believe, and, I, and we're asking for external validation from three different oversight bodies, CARF, AAS, and ICMI, all three, looking for level three AAS certification for our VCL in, in fiscal 2017. 
But the challenge now is for us to better integrate that as part of the fabric of mental health care in the organization to reduce suicide. So that priority comes out from under contact centers because we built the infrastructure and goes up under suicide prevention. So taking all of these to the next level. You, saw, you see the item down there for non-clinical frontline training, not just for MSAs, for housekeeping aides, for biomed techs, for sterile processing uh, technicians, frontline training for our staff. I'm going to click through a couple of these because I want to leave us some time here. HR excellence, we've cut the time to hire and fill a position for a medical center director in half. This particular year, we still got more work to do. We're working the same issue and the same process on chiefs of staff for associate directors and assistant directors. We've now got folks, we've worked on a hire right, hire fast program for MSAs, for our medical support assistants, our scheduler, 25,000 of them, because it's a position with high turnover. We're now working on nurses. We have 92,000 nurses. We're the largest employer of nurses in the country. We don't do a good job of hiring and onboarding. We don't go, do a good job of attracting and retaining the very best. Our processes don't support those outcomes. I want to make a quick comment about supply chain. This is med surge supply chain. Uh, interestingly, I, and it still boggles my mind, how an organization can have a world-class supply chain for pharmacy and in the very same organization have no integrated supply chain for med surge, both for expendables as well or, or uh, uh, expendables as well as durable medical equipment. We got 150 medical centers doing their own thing. So we've been working for a year now, building the essential pieces of infrastructure uh, for an integrated supply chain. 2017, we saved about $150 million this year. I'm hoping that we save multiples of that this next year. I think that's actually still just low hanging fruit. This is a huge opportunity for us. Also an opportunity in terms of improving uh, improving execution uh, around delivery. Uh, brand new med surge prime vendor coming online uh, within about a month. In fact, I think it's later this month in December. Um, I'm gonna skip the EHR. If somebody wants to talk about that, we can. Um, diffusion of excellence, we've already talked about that one, so I'm gonna skip it. Uh, strategic engagement, I'll just, or rather strategic partnerships, just one really quick comment there. Um, when I was at the USO, I experienced the from the outside in experience uh, of, of VA. And when we showed up to talk about things that we thought we might be able to do help to help with employment transition, it was more of a, what are you doing in our space? We got this. Uh, from my perspective, our whole approach towards strategic partnerships now is, is starts with a sense of humility. Uh, the realization that we don't have all the answers, we don't have it all figured out. Uh, we can't do it ourselves, we need lots of help. And I find, we find, we are finding as that's changed around the organization that the world becomes our oyster. We got all kinds of opportunities that are coming at us. Our biggest challenge is responding to those and being kind of strategic about that. And a lot of that has to do with our federal healthcare partners as well. So. Our commitment is to try to be the very best partner that we can. And that means we gotta focus on our partner's needs, not just on our own needs. Finally, as we move forward and we look forward, we're looking at VA as a seamless network where we're making decisions that, that, that are right for veterans and right for taxpayers, the very best care, the very best care experience. Uh, and building that seamless network so that it's not a question of inside or outside, it's a question of just a natural transition as we become better managers of healthcare outcome and healthcare delivery and better managers of population health. I'd be glad to take questions from the audience. Sorry I didn't leave any more time than I did for questions. Anybody? Yes, please. I've had the opportunity and the honor and the privilege to serve side by side with several of the VA uh, facilities, both at Biloxi when I was the commander there and then oversight air mobility command, especially with the Travis Air Force Base. And uh, watched our joint ventures uh, very quietly and professionally grow uh, to meet the demands and the needs at the local area. We were riding a pretty good wave until uh, the sea shift 
when, uh, again, for, the, for good reasons that had to do with uh, the Choice Act and then, and then the ability for the VA to make us the preferred provider. Mm -hmm. As you know, we've lost you know, the mutual benefit. They want to be seen by us, we want to see them. We know we've lost as much as 25% of our referrals, if not more, just for example, at Travis. And so I know it has to do with pots of money. I know it has to do with financial management to the priorities up there. Just wondering how you and Dr. Geis are working through that. Okay, uh, what a great question. Um, Choice is one of seven different programs, in virtually all in statute, that we use to deliver care in the community. There are different reimbursement rates, different pots of money, different eligibility criteria, different reimbursement processes. One of the great ironies of Choice is that choice, because we are the secondary payer and not the primary payer, makes it virtually impossible for us to use DOD for choice. How insane is that? In October of 2015, we went to Congress, Bally and I, Bally Yehea and I, went to Congress and presented them a plan to consolidate these seven into one. We're still waiting for legislation. We can't do it without help from Congress. We even picked some of the ba very most basic kinds of things, like letting VA be the secondary payer in choice, which would make all the difference in the world, and, and got, that, got it in the, in the Veterans First Act, and, and, and Chairman Isaacson could not get the Veterans First Act to a vote on the floor of the Senate. So I feel your pain. This is, this is part of what the guys hear me fussing about is when, when something's forcing you to do something that's wrong for veterans and wrong for taxpayers, you gotta push back. And that's why, that's why I sit, stand up here and say, I shouldn't have agreed, I shouldn't have said 90 days. I should have said, fine, you know, 90 days, okay, we're gonna take like 270 or we're gonna take a year to go do this because we're gonna do it right because I can't do the right thing for veterans and taxpayers and roll this thing out in 90 days. My mistake, that's on me. So I hear you loud and clear. It's awful, and, and, but we need help to fix it. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, thank you for being here today. I'm Karen Morrison, I work for the Navy Medicine Strategy Office, and I noticed you had a slide on strategic partnerships. Yes. We have a strategic goal on partnerships, and what we've done is we've done some research and background and check. We have MOUs and MOAs and some exchange money and some exchange people. But what we found is we didn't have a criteria or a framework of which to go and choose to go into a strategic partnership. In other words, what attributes should we be looking at? Do you have such a thing within the VA that you use to help guide in looking at the partnerships that will best serve? Um. The short answer is yes, but I think the opportunity here is to get you sitting down with people in that specific space that where, where we would look to be collaborating with you. Uh, most veterans in America know my email address, sloan.gibson at va.gov. Send me a note. I'll get you connected with exactly the right people, both the folks that are helping to create or have created this sort of broader architecture for strategic partnerships. This is another case. We, we've, got, we, we've got people in the private sector that wanna donate a new facility to VA in Omaha, Nebraska, and we can't get Congress to give us the legislative authority to be able to do it. That's some of the challenges that we're faced with strategic partnerships. So we're working in a straitjacket, if you will, but you email me and we'll get you together with the right folks. Great, thank you. Okay, you bet. Yes, Captain. Good morning, sir. Captain Nissan Simon, a family med physician, associate medical director at the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Health Service uh, Corps. Great. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, two questions. One, I'm very curious as to your efficiencies with assessing physicians and that significant decrement in time, because as you're well aware, it might take us nine months or so just to bring on a GS, a civil service physician, and we just lose people all the time. I mean, these are highly educated, qualified folks. They have many other opportunities, and there are just so many hurdles with that. That's a big challenge for us. And uh, also, and I don't know if that's too much in the weeds for you, but uh, no, it's question, not too much in the weeds. Um, the other question: any comments on? Sometimes we lose 
providers, um, civilian providers, due to the payment uh, process system, the medical payment authorization system, which we use, utilize the VA uh, to help process our medical payment. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we utilize the VA system to help process those uh, claims for that health care that the ICE detainees uh, obtain. Yes. Uh, and sometimes yes. that can take quite a bit of time. Okay. And, uh, and in that process, you also lose providers due to that length of time. I don't know if you have any info. I have, I have insights on both of those. All right, thanks, things. sir. First of all, um, let me take the last question first, and then you may have to remind me what the first question sure. was, because my, my span of attention is about this long. Um, we used to process payments for care in the community at 70 different locations. Those 70 different locations reported up into 23 different visions. There was no single point at which they came together. And so about two years ago, we, we consolidated that into a single organization. And immediately, we began to address some of the systemic problems about people, process, and technology. Mm -hmm. Staffing, business practices, technology resources, and what's happened is the absolutely dismal uh, timeliness of payment mm -hmm. to providers, and this is for not for choice care, but uh, for other care in the community, not choice related, uh, has gone from now, now we're somewhere right around 85% being processed within 30 days. Oh. And that's come from the floor, somewhere down here. We've roughly doubled staff, we've invested in technology, we're driving our, our, our part, our providers in the community to use uh, uh, electronic data transfer to, to be able to send their bills in because a lot of the stuff we get is coming in in paper and we scan it and lose it and do all those other kinds of things. So number one, we're, we're fixing that one. The, the other, the first question had to yeah, do with- How you decrease the time for hiring? Uh, time to hire. Uh, so, so this is amazing. Uh, almost invariably that when I sit down, so, you know, we're, we're, something's not working the way I think it needs to work. And I get a bunch of people around the table and, you know, it starts out by people saying, well, you can't do this or you can't do that. And by, you know, within about 30 minutes, we figured out we are our own worst enemy. And in fact, yeah, we can do exactly that. And so one of the things that we've been doing is identifying those barriers and obstacles. We've been leaning processes. We've been changing regulation where we needed to, rewriting internal policy. Right now, we are in the midst of trying to eliminate what we call a professional standards board, which every hy hybrid Title 38 and every nurse has to go before a professional standards board before we can actually make them an offer, a real commitment offer with a salary number. It is not value added, uh, and it and it causes it forces us to lose that. Why do we have that in place? That's our policy. It's been there for twenty some odd years, and we're working through the issues again with our good friends in organized labor to be able to eliminate that. I can't tell you how many nurses have emailed me to say, "Please get rid of the professional standards board." It, it's it's. It's home cooking, it's unfair, it's biased, it's all these other kinds of things. So, the, the, and I'm glad to get some of our guys to sit down with some of your guys on the HR front to look specifically at these things. We had Beth uh, Cobert over recently uh, talking about the GS side, not the hybrid 38 side. And she handed us all a little booklet that they've created called Mythbusters. And it's all designed to, to enlighten people to say, you, you're doing it this way? You don't have to. You know that, don't you? You can do it this way. You know, we, we, we busted our pick trying to hire digital services team members. And until we got OPM and general counsel and everybody else at the table to bust the miss, uh, we, weren't able to hire, we weren't able to hire one. We now have 30-some-odd digital service team folks. Glad Thanks, to sir. help. Glad to help. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Eileen Robeck. I'm um, co-chair of the Primary Care Pain Champions Initiative and director of virtual pain care for the Richmond VA. Ah, great. I worked in the private sector for 25 years. I've been with the VA for a little over nine. When it comes to adequately treating pain at the primary care level, the private sector really cannot touch what we've been able to do in the VA. Within primary care, we've addressed pain 
on entry into primary care with disease self-management, CBD classes in primary care, pain schools, bringing addiction medicine into primary care, bringing mental health into primary care. It, I get people from the private sector coming to me saying, how did you do that? We have primary care-based pain teams. We use pharmacy. The list could go on. We did a, our presentation on it earlier. So we have some concerns about the robustness of being able to proceed with a commitment to that kind of multimodality care and primary care into the future. Uh, and want to know if there is the commitment to understanding that there are some things that really are best done within the VA setting, or if they're done outside of the VA setting with very high quality case management with coordination of care. So I wanted, uh, I didn't see that on your list, and thank I was you. wondering thank if that was um, anywhere within the system. So thank you. Um, Stop and think for a second about our patient population. If any large healthcare organization in America should have the management of chronic pain as a deep specialty more than VA, I want to know who it is. Think about our patient population. Older, sicker, and poorer. Uh, you know, over half of our veterans are 65 and over. Chronic pain is pervasive in our, in, our, in our patient base. So absolutely positively, yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, go out on a limb here and speculate that you guys in Richmond are probably doing some things better than some folks at other VA medical centers around the country. Uh, for example, I spent a good bit of time in Toma. I'm not sure we were managing chronic pain in Toma, Wisconsin, as well as you guys are managing it in Richmond. So now we're back to this topic of being able to, to diffuse best practice across the enterprise. The, 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 this is a cultural issue for VA, because this, this idea of, of accepting best practice from somebody else when the preconceived notion is my VA is unlike anybody else's VA, gets in the way of us being able to do that as effectively as we should. We're getting ready to get the hook. I don't want to belabor the point, but that actually is a fabulous example because when Toma got into trouble, they were one email away from communicating with me as, as co-chair of the primary care pain champions. Um, task force at that point and I to presented to Toma and we were in touch. So it, it also then as a system enables places that are not doing as well to communicate across this a broad system with others that can give them ideas. This is the broad strategic per, uh, imperative we have to operate like an integrated enterprise. Instead of having pockets of excellence, we need to diffuse that excellence across the enterprise. I am awfully sorry. I, I am the hook. <laughs> <laughs> we are out of time. Mr. Gibson, th th thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'm going to grab that right there. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Well, that's it, folks. Uh, this 125th AMSIS meeting uh, is, is now concluded. Uh, thank you for your attendance, and I'll see you right back here at 126.